This is episode 74 of The Variety Artist. I'm John Abrams, the guy that interviews successful variety artists from around the world. Today, our guest is Eric Haynes. Eric is a unique performer. His one-man band performances are amazing, but there's a lot more to him than just that. He's passionate about creating routines and acts that are unique, different, and most of all, you. Enjoy. Oh, oh, he also sings a song and does an entire performance for us. Now on to the interview. Fun fact number 14. John prides himself on never missing a UFC or Bellator fight. Welcome to The Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. He's the guitar slinging comedian that brings pure entertainment to the world of comedy with an act that's part rock concert, part comedy show, and part twisted bizarre circus. Weird Al Yankovic says, you to bomb. Louis Anderson says, engaging, honest, and heartfelt. You will love him. Variety artist, I give you one-man band, Eric Haynes. Hi, everybody. How you doing? <laughs> What's going on, Eric? <laughs> Not much. Just sipping my coffee, sitting in a squeaky chair, doing this interview with you. Wait, here's my squeaky chair. Wait. There you go. Can you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> See, I bought this chair specifically so that if I was recording something, it was, it was really quiet when I was in the store, but no, no not anymore. No. Yeah, mine either. <laughs> all right, before we get started on your one-man band thing, I was looking at your videos, and you do all sorts of crazy things. Tell me all the different things other than the one-man band thing. Well, I started out as a juggler, so I do some juggling bits, um, a lot of variety bits, so I would we'll kind of go kind of go into history a little bit. I was on tour with my wife for a couple of years. We were doing my Missoula Children's Theater, and we were tour actors for that, and so mm -hmm. we were coming into town one time. I started singing this song to her. She says, you're not going to put that in a show, are you? And I said, yes, I am. I'm going to dress a volunteer like a flower and I'm going to dress like a bee and I'm going to sing this opera song to her. So <laughs> I wrote this song called Napweed, which is audience participation thing. I go out and I pull an audience member. I take them behind the screen and, and then it ends up being this opera song. Well, I've used that for many years doing comedy shows and stuff. So it's like a variety thing like you'd see in, a, in more of a, a vaudeville type of show. Yeah. I made a monkey marionette that's been a kind of a core part of the show for a long time. That means I do wood carving and uh, puppet design. Uh, one Man Band was 2010, so that's a relatively recent addition compared to a lot of the other stuff. Oh, I didn't know that. So you started out before the One Man Band. You were doing all sorts of things before that. Right. I, I learned to juggle when I was a sophomore in high school, and then somebody paid me $10 to do a kid's birthday party, and it was like, okay, I get paid money to do something that I'm doing all the time anyway. You know, my parents were looking, going, why is he just juggling in the backyard all the time? Yeah. Then once I started getting, realized that I could make money doing it, then I started sort of marketing it around. And there really wasn't a whole lot of other entertainment in Missoula that was available for that type of market. So I ended up booking a lot of shows and continued mm. to do that. And that's, that's, the, that's sort of the seed, the genesis of going into doing show business type stuff was somebody pays you to do something that you like to do anyway. And then you go, oh, okay, then I'm going to expand it. Did theater, did dance, but, did, but always continued to do juggling shows and had that be the core of, of everything. Okay. I always say we have the greatest job in the world. You know, we get to do what we love and we get paid for it. What a Yeah, job. you get to pick what you do. Yeah. Now, something that a lot of people don't, may not know about you, you're the one-man band, you do the juggling thing, but you mentioned wood carving and you're an amazing artist, right? Well, I, I do my little drawings. People seem to like them, so I guess. <laughs> well, it's true. Hi, Eric's, being, Eric's being humble. He's, he's an amazing artist. All right. <laughs> That leads us right into our fan questions. Do you want some fan questions there? Sure, you bet. Louis Fox, uh, we all know Louis. He had episode 72 of The Variety Artist. He was fantastic. He's one-man sideshow. Uh, ask him about drawing a picture a day for a year, and the result of doing that was for him personally and professionally. Ah, that's a good question. So in 2014, I had performing acts like a, a reset button for me. I think it's the adrenaline where I feel sharp and, and engaged and everything. And I start to get really, if I'm in one place for too long, I start to get this sort of cabin fever feeling of panic. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there, it's January. I've finished up my December 
gigs. I'm, I'm usually very busy in December and it's near the end of January and I'm going, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know. And, and I started taking catalog of uh, different skills that I have that I, I haven't utilized. I've always drawn pictures and everything. And so I said, you know what? I'm just going to do this. I'm going to do a 20 minutes a day. I'm going to do one sketch a day. Mm-hmm. I sat down and, and I, on my computer screen was a picture of somebody, I think it was in an airport with a luggage rack and a couple kids. So I do a quick sketch of that. And then the next day I took out a piece of paper and I started drawing and it was a little bit more complicated picture and it took a, a lot longer than 20 minutes. I think it took three hours for me to complete. And as I went along and then I, I thought, you know what? this is a a creative process that I feel like I need to go through. So I'm going to, I need accountability partners. So I posted it. I said, I'm going to draw a picture a day for a year. Hmm. And then I started doing it. What I found was that uh, it sort of unlocked different stuff for me. One of the things it did is if you're drawing pictures, you're seeing what the colors are and everything. So I became much more observant as time went along. There were also times where I, picked a project that was a little too complicated for the time that I had that day to do anything. Yeah. So what you, you learn to be a little bit more economical where you think to yourself, okay, I only ha- have like 15 minutes. Um, what am I going to draw today? Cause I have to draw something. And so you would, I would uh, try to pick a, something that was very simple. Like one time I did a rooster. Well, the rooster didn't take very long to draw, but it actually came out quite well. A lot of people were very complimentary on it. So it, uh, the co- how complicated a picture is, is not really what people look at. They can like something that was done very quickly, or they can like something that was done with a lot of effort into it. Mm-hmm. That was one of the things was that something that's very simple. And that was a lesson I knew from juggling too. I mean, if somebody juggles eight balls, most audiences can't count that high. Right. So they just literally don't know how many are up there. You're doing something that's very difficult to do, takes a lot of effort, and it doesn't get the appreciation that it was if it was something simpler that they could grasp. Right. So the same thing holds true for art. If you do something every day, what it does, and, and people start to appreciate it and look forward to it, I mean, it's a, a good ego boost for you. That was not why I was doing it, but um, I also sold some of the pictures at the end of that process oh. and had somebody call me to do a commissions. I had two or three commissions that I, I did where people called me and said, Hey, I want you to draw a picture for me. And this is something that I didn't really have as a market before then. Oh. So if you go out and if you have the initiative to do something, it'll generate its own market where somebody says, Oh, I like that. That's good. I want to buy that. Yeah. So that's one of the lessons was that if you do something every day, you'll get good at it. Yeah. So that's the other thing that I talk to people about when I hear that they don't have original material. I'll say you have to write every day. And when I look at comedians that I know, the ones that are that I know are going to be successful are the ones that are sitting over there with their notebook writing. The ones that I, I know are going to flounder for a while and then probably disappear and end up working somewhere else are the ones who are not writing in their notebook. Mm. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. If, if somebody is really motivated, if they're ambitious about something, they will be successful at it. And if you're, Resting on your laurels, if you're not changing, if you're not uh, developing something new, then you're not moving at all. You, you, you're either going to decay or you're going to move forward. Right. So the drawings really kind of help bring that into focus. Hmm. So it was a very good process to go through. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Matt Baker. Of course, you know all these guys, right? Yep. <laughs> Matt Baker. I have to read what he, what he has on his Facebook. He's a self-employed badass comedian and Louis Fox's podcast partner. Right. Yes. Yeah. They do the odd and offbeat podcast, which is like, that's right. We're like a podcast group here. We are. Yes. All right. He says, ask him what performing in tights feels like and the best way to pad your private area. (laughs) Well, I never padded my private area. Oh, the answer is dance belt. And I avoided using a dance belt for a long time because it's got a thong type of thing that goes up the crack of your butt. So I was, I was opposed to that for a long time. But then, uh, like the last fair we did, there is this uh, dude running around in a Spider-Man outfit. And uh, the clown came up and she said to me, he needs to get a cup. <laughs> I said, well, what he needs oh, no. is a dance belt. A dance belt kind of makes, makes so that you can't see exactly what's going on under the tights. It holds in your parts. It holds in your parts very securely and, and, uh, and well. So that's what you have to have. There you go, Matt. That was for Matt. 
Yeah, thanks, Matt. <laughs> you tell me. Now, now ask Matt that same question. <laughs> okay, wait, Matt, I'm going to get you on this podcast, and, and I'm going to ask you the exact same question, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. It's a light he has a second question. Ask about his favorite silent film star, and then Louie, he chimed in and said, more specifically, ask him to sing about his favorite film star. Ah, okay. Well, my favorite silent film star is Buster Keaton. And so I, I wrote a song about Buster Keaton, which I, I can play it for you if you like. But do you want to do it? Sure. Do you mind? Sure. I've got kind of a basic setup here in my office. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I'd with, love it. But I've got a little here. Just a second. Let's just okay. Yeah. Get it organized Take your time. Grab it. So I've got a little toy bass drum and hi hat here. So we'll see if that makes it work. Okay. Okay. Oh, wait. Too. It's a bonus. So my office, for those of you who've never seen it, is covered with instruments, and so I come up here and play sometimes. And so this is a this is a song I wrote. To, this is probably first year that I did it. Probably 2010 or so. Okay. But anyway, favorite favorite comedian is Buster Keaton. <laughs> Back when films were silent, the comedians couldn't talk. They had to fight to make them laugh all the audience would walk. they do some death-defying stunts that they still can't match today. Why is everybody laughing? What did that feller say? But Buster Keaton never said a word. He just told the funniest jokes you've never heard. He'd have him rolling in the aisle. He'd break his neck just to make him smile. But Buster Keaton never said a word. Now you could say that Chuck Morris was tough. You can talk about Jackie Chan. And evil can evil, he's a daredevil. But when it comes to comedy, comes to genius, Buster is the man. Never said a word. He just told the funniest jokes you've never heard. He'd have them rolling in the aisle. He'd break his neck just to make them smile. But Buster Keaton never said a word. <laughs> if there was a bunch of us, we'd all be applauding in here. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> that was cool. I enjoyed that. So let's let's focus on your one man band. Yeah. So people can picture this in their head. What instruments do you have on you when you're doing your one man band? Well, there's about 22 instruments right now. Basically what it is, if you picture Bert from Mary Poppins, how he had a bass drum on his back, that's what most people picture when you say the word one man band. Um, my drum is oriented the same way as that. It's oriented sideways. There's some other one man bands who have the drum flat on their back. Mine's out like that. It's very old fashioned. It looks like it's from the 1920s. And there is an array of instruments in front of me that almost makes it look like I have a beard made out of horns. Mm -hmm. So they're all little brass horn looking things and doodads or whatever. Right now there's, I think, four kazoos on there, a siren. I'm trying to go through this here. A uh, hosophonium, which is basically like a trombone, but it's just made out of a section of, of hose that wraps around. And then I made a bell. It looks like an old gramophone bell, but it's made out of a uh, funnel from a auto parts store and mm -hmm. the bell from a spittoon. Oh. So I'm the foremost American maker of spittoon based instruments to the best of my knowledge. <laughs> um, and then it's got, so that's sticking out the back and just a whole bunch of other, you know, slide whistles and other stuff like that. Yeah. Now, did you start out with one or two instruments or did you have this idea in your head for this multi-instrument one-man band thing? Oh, uh, the fir very first time I took it out, um, I believe there were 10 instruments on there. If you include the, you know, the hi-hat is one instrument, the bass drum is one instrument, the banjo is one instrument, and then there was, uh, I think, seven other instruments. So it already had, the very first thing that I did is, is put a kazoo, a duck call, I think I had a harmonica on there. Mm-hmm. I've since eliminated harmonica because it's really 
hard for me to play as far as how it is on my lips. It just wears out, especially if you're doing so many sets per day. And I'm not very good at harmonica. So oh, it seemed like right. a logical instrument to take out and put in some things that uh, would make the sounds that I wanted it to make. I'm not guitar-based or harmonica-based, which is uh, uh, most other one-man bands who have the situation that I am where they're doing stand-up, they usually have a harmonica and a guitar. That's right. Uh, yep, 22, there's about... Besides the the banjo and drums, there's, I think, 10 main instruments that I play almost every song that are on there that are noise rhythm things. So it's sort of like a um, uh, drum fill. Where's the bulk of your work? Where do you work mostly? You know, for eight years, I was on the road doing comedy. Oh. Uh, I was part of a team, and we were called the Rock and Roll Comedy Circus of Death, and we would tour for two weeks on, two weeks off. Wait, wait, back up, back up. What is it called again? The Rock and Roll Comedy Circus of Death. Okay, go ahead. I just had to hear that again. Yeah, that came about because we were doing a radio interview and they said, well, what, uh, tell people what your show is like. And, and I said that on air and then we said, that would make a good t-shirt. So let's yeah. call it that. So I spent eight years doing that. We went Splitsville between the two of us and I went back to doing something that was more akin to what I'd come up with, which was stilt walking and juggling and, and started marketing more to fairs and festivals and that kind of thing. So I still do comedy shows. Um, that's one market. And then one time the economy stumbled. I can't remember when it was. Uh, no. Most of those went away where all of a sudden the market changed. The The pools on the savannah dried up until they were very small and only a few animals came to drink. <laughs> True. Uh, and so you go, well, this market's gone. So what am I going to do? Um, and I just finished a show for Mill Creek Festival, stage show. And I said, hey, listen, uh, if it wouldn't bother you, I'd like to try out this new thing that I just built. And I'd been experimenting with it and had it down enough to where I felt I could take it out in public for the first time. So I walked out with an on. And when I got to the main thoroughfare going through there, a crowd gathered. And I went, okay, this is, ah. this, this is going to work. Because when I first started doing it, once again, this was a time when the, the economy had, had gone down. Um, this is 2010. So I'm still working. I'm still doing shows, but my wife is starting to get nervous. And so she brings me this thing for an application to be a census taker. Oh, great. And I went in the garage and built the one-man band. Yeah. So, <laughs> that, that, that'll be incentive for you. Yeah, and she's going, you already haul so much heavy stuff. Why are you building this big, heavy thing? This is stupid. <laughs> and I was going, uh, well, I, I just feel like I need to build it. Is there anybody else doing it? No, not that I could find. I looked online. Nobody else is doing it. How do you know there's going to be a market for it? I don't. I just have to do this right now. Yeah. And so when I built it and walked out and immediately had a crowd gather, then I went, okay, this is going to be successful. Yeah. And it was, it was right off the bat. Like uh, the first year that I did it, I got a couple calls for corporate events down in San Francisco. And so I went down and did those right, right at the get go. Nice. So I knew it was going to be a, a valid thing to do. It was a, uh, the baby was walking right out of the, yeah. Right after the birth right there. So at the fair, so people are gathering around and, and you said, Hey, I have something here. So then did you go on to market it to fairs and festivals or corporates or both or what? I didn't really market it per se. What you do is, what I would do is uh, if I come up with a new idea, then I gradually add it into the show. It's a separate thing for me to walk out and just do a quick set where I go out and play a few songs and come back. And, and then I've said, okay, I've won. The one man band is developing. It's on its feet. It's working. Um, it's a different thing. So it probably took about, I don't know, a year to put it on stage as part of the stage show where I would come out because I had to figure out how to get it off to go on and do the juggling show. So I, I gradually added it in. I would do, you know, one song on the one man band to start the show and then uh, do a quick take the one man band off and go on and do the regular show. A little bit later than when I was doing shows in, in comedy rooms, then I would still do the one man band. I don't know if you know about this, but if you interview comedians, the, if you tell a comedian not to do something, their instinct is to go, I'm definitely going to do that. Of course. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so me being a prop comic, basically, even though everything is skill-based, it's not it's just that I'm pulling something out and saying, and this is a thing that does this, you know, yeah. it's skill-based. So the standups that know me really well usually like my act, but the, but the initial reaction is a really anti-prop act. You pull out a guitar and everybody says he's just a guitar comedian or whatever, right? So my instinct was to do the, what the, what the stand-up's instincts are. 
mm-hmm. is if they say that you're not supposed to have props on stage, I'm going to have as many props on stage as possible. Dang it. Say it should just purely be stand up mon- monologue. Okay, well, I'm going to go up on stage and I'm going to sing songs. I'm going to tap dance. I'm going to do whatever it is that I have to do that is non stand up, but is still comedy. Yeah. To do that. So there's a little bit of that rebellious spirit that goes along with doing stand up that, that I, I hold to. So do you have some, uh, we'll, we'll go back to fairs. I, I, I don't mean to go back to that, but well, yeah, I do mean to oh, go back do to that. Oh, do go actually. back. That's my main market right now. Yeah, that, that's your main market. So how do they pay you? Usually, usually in money. Sometimes <laughs> we trade chickens. <laughs> One time I got a goat. That was a banner day. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is, do they pay you for the day, for the show? For the, how does that work? Uh, it depends on how it's, how it's negotiated. So if you're doing just a short run, like, let's say the fair says, we just want you to come in and do one show. Then you have a negotiated price for that. Normally what a fair does with me is they will come to my booth at a convention and they'll say, hey, listen, we've got this many days. And I'll say, okay, I'm available for the run. Here's what I charge per day. Here's how many sets I do. And here's what, I, here's what the cost is. And mm-hmm. it's a daily charge. I'm a little bit ambitious. I usually do four sets a day. Most people just do three. And it's uh, set up to, for, on my end, to, to say that uh, you can have whatever you want. If you want three stilt walking sets in one stage show, that's fine. If you want all one-man band, a lot of people are booking just all one-man band roving for the entire fair. And if I fly, that's usually what I book because um, it's too much effort to, to pack all the other stuff in there. To, it's, it's expensive to haul the rest of my show anywhere. Yeah. So, but my one man band and clothing fits into two fifty pound suitcases. I designed it to break down for flight. I can go over and do fly over and do. I just did Ohio State Fair, and that was what I did was one man band for the for all the sets that I did each day. Right. Yeah. I was just wondering how specifically the the uh, the fair market worked. I've never worked it. Ah. Well, I I host a podcast myself called Fairs and Fair Entertainers, or not fair. That's not what it's called. It's called Tailgate Entertainer. Oh um, yeah. Tailgate Entertainer, and that was uh, started by Alan Bruce, and it's all about the fair industry. It's it's worth a listen if you're interested in that market because it's very insightful as far as how all that stuff works. Oh, excellent. But the fair market is usually done through conventions. So you can book independently with each fair, but if you go to convention, then it's a trade show. You're set up on a trade show floor, like IAFI is the big one. It's um, Right now it's in San Antonio, Texas. It used to be in Vegas. And there are 400 booths. So each 10 by 10 booth has a different act doing whatever it is. So you can have, you know, 30 magicians, 20 comedy jugglers, and they're all gathered in the same place. Then you've got people who are doing more unusual things like Mark Brown does a uh, rocket robot, which is a very tall, I think he's uh, I want to say eight feet tall. I could be wrong on that. Wow. He's a very detailed robot that, looks like a real futuristic robot and he dances and talks and everything. It's very, very cool. Um, So when you're on the trade show floor and you can see these things, it's pretty amazing to see what all the different types of acts that you would do. I think that the fair circuit is more what the, if you were to compare it to what the vaudeville circuit used to be like when vaudeville was popular, Mm -hmm. that's where a lot of the vaudeville acts have gone. Sure. So do you have some, some crazy fair stories for us? You've got to have some. I don't really have crazy fair stories. I do have crazy comedy stories, though, because that was working some strange places. Oh, well, well, as long as we're here, give it to us. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Do you have one? Louis brought up in the, uh, the, what questions do you want to ask Eric about, uh, ask him about the guy named Mudslide. Oh, yeah, I have that. In fact, we're going to, yeah, we're going to get in. Well, go ahead. Okay. So, so he writes that and I, 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 cause we've done some weird gigs together. Me and Louis, uh, Louis Fox, uh, came up in comedy as well. Both of us do comedy club type rooms. And so we've done some weird gigs together and I was, I had to text him and say, okay, you got to remind me cause I don't, I don't remember. I think it was some guy with a cowboy hat and he was wearing a disco shirt. He says, you're close. You're close. It was a full like tails tuxedo sequined and it was a biker bar. Oh, so I had to ask, okay, was that the biker bar where the guy pulled the knife on me? Oh, and then the guy was one, the homeless guy was wandering around yelling federal beef. And he says, I, he says, I'm not sure you could probably mix some of these gigs together. So, (laughs) so there's that. I do a routine or used to do a routine. No, uh, wait, 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 wait. Don't just pass over someone, someone pulling a knife on you and what? And a homeless guy, what? (laughs) Well, that's uh, that was the bar. It was a, a biker bar. Part of my, one of my routines was that I would 
juggle. I've got these big hunting knives. They're not juggling knives, but I juggle them. And they're about, I want to say 14, 16 inches long. And as part of the deal, I would have a, a volunteer hold a carrot in their teeth and then, you know, cut the end off the carrot and then juggle them to have some, some comedy stuff that I was doing around that. So I, I take out my knife and the guy takes out his knife and I say, mine's bigger. Uh -oh. He kind of chuckles and he puts his away. <laughs> so that was, <laughs> that was that story. It is. A lot of different biker bars through the years. I have I did one where uh, I did a, a school show in the morning, and then that night, this is in State Line, Idaho, if I remember right. And there's a bar where there's an actual track that goes through the bar where people ride their Harleys through the center of the bar. Mm -hmm. And I did a two-hour show, two-hour comedy show in that bar that night after doing a school assembly in the in the morning, which is a big shifting of gears. You got to yeah. shift your mindset back to what you need to do to accomplish what you need to accomplish for each type of show. <laughs> All right. Well, let's take a little left-hand turn here. Talk about some different things that are a little cerebral. Let's talk about originality. I was watching a lot of your videos, all of your comedy stuff, your one-man band stuff. Uh, a lot of it's so original. Uh, do you have a method or something about creating original material? I think you have to have a predilection where you go, this is a goal. I want to make sure that stuff that I do is mine. It's not something that I took from some other source. So, I mean, you can have influences or you can see something you think is cool and you can go off of that. I'm not the first person to do one man band, Yeah, but you have to find a way to make whatever it is your own. I'm kind of preachy about that a lot of times where um, if I see an act, I'll go, okay, have you read Judy Carter's The Comedy Bible? You need to read that book take it to heart and start writing original material. Cause I'll see something where somebody has stolen material from someone else. Yeah. And that drives me crazy. And especially in the uh, fair and variety markets where you'll see a magician, you go, Hey, that was a pretty good act. And then you see the next magician come on and you go, that was the same act. That's and then right. you see the next magician and it's, yeah, that's also the same act They They just took the routine that was presented in the same book and they're doing exactly the same way or they're, they've stolen lines from the same people and it ends up being this homogenized thing where someone who is a, a fair booker goes, uh, we're going to have a magician there and it doesn't matter which one because they're all the same. Uh -huh. So you have to find some way to make what you're doing your own. That's part of the reason that I've made the choices that I have for one man band for making it look like it's old and I'm not using a bass drum beater from a drum set. It's actually just a simple lever system because I want that primitive look and I want that to be a unique way of doing it. Even if it makes it more difficult, it's worth it to me to have something that's uh, different from what everybody else does. Like I said, I get a little preachy about it. Uh, I think okay. you should be writing your own material. I don't think you should be uh, taking it from other sources. And if you do get on your feet by doing something that's uh, that's a prescribed thing, where you you know you've got a book on comedy juggling, uh, Rich Chamberlain's comedy juggling book was a really good one. It's a little pamphlet thing and it had some very simple routines in it that everybody does, that are kind of common things. They're stock material that everybody knows. Mm -hmm. And I've seen really superb jugglers that have used routines that were present in that book, but they found a way to make it their own. So if you start out by doing whatever the stock routine is, there comes a certain point where you have to go, I have to mature enough to make this different. So I have to write original lines. I have to figure out a different way to do it. And that's why, uh, like as a magician, Louis Fox is really great because he not only creates the effects, he also creates original material around it. It's his. Yeah. So if he fails, it's on his own merits. It's not because he didn't understand the words he was reading in the book. Right. So that's, that's a big thing. The drive to do something that's from you. There's other people who go, well, you know what? I, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like I have the skills to be a writer. Well, yeah, you do. You go to coffee, you have experiences. All you got to do is remember the ones that made your friends laugh. And then you use those on stage. Yeah, that's not to say that everything I do is 100% perfectly original because there's uh, so much out there that you're going to find something that's similar, but it's never intentionally the same as somebody else's. I know I've, I've come up with ideas in my own head and, and started working on a routine and then all of a sudden I see it on YouTube and I'm like, oh darn, someone already thought of that. <laughs> exactly. Concurrent thinking. So you yep. can do concurrent thinking where two people come up with the same bit for the crocodile hunter or whatever. But as long as it's yours, as long as you are the one who came up with it, if, if the jokes aren't good, at least they're my jokes, at least they're <laughs> ones that I wrote, right? So I'll take full credit or, or responsibility for them, whichever way it goes. I'll take a nosedive. Yeah, I'll take a nosedive. You got to have the uh, confidence to step out and do that and, and do what's yours, not somebody else. 
Now, what do you mean by, uh, I know I, I sent you some paperwork and you wrote back something about market development. What did you mean by market development? Okay, so I grew up in Missoula, Montana, very relatively small town, I guess. Uh, I think it's over 100,000 now in the Missoula area. When I started doing juggling shows, there wasn't anybody else doing juggling shows. There wasn't a market. Mm-hmm. So all this stuff where people sit around and they go, well, I've got to find a, an agent or somebody to book me. That's not how it works. If you have a good act, you will create your own market. Yeah. Like Steve Jobs did with the iPad. There wasn't yeah. an iPad before. He found the best way to present it and created a market for it or smartphones. Mm-hmm. You know, people who say that, that everything's already been done. No, it hasn't. Look at a smartphone that, you know, if you go back to 1950, people would think you were a, a witch. <laughs> yeah. If you showed up with this thing that contained the entire sum of human knowledge in it, you know? If you watch the Jetsons back then, I used to watch the Jetsons cartoon, which was like the Flintstones in the future, right? Right. Uh, but they used to talk to each other face to face from far away. Like now we have Skype. Yeah. And back then it was like, it was a big deal. It was all oh, that'll never happen. That'll happen, you know, hundreds of years from now. Exactly. Yeah. Dick Tracy was the first one to really do that where he had a watch on his wrist. But I'm sure if you go back to Buck Rogers and stuff, they would have video conferencing things that they would do too. So markets keep on developing for things that don't exist yet. That's the point we were going for there is, is the, uh, the whole idea that if you have an idea and you have something that's original, you can create your own market. You can make it into something that wasn't there before. And so those markets can be school assembly programs, comedy shows, uh, work in the fair market. One market dries up, you shift gears and you move to the other one. Or you may have a market that changes what the requirements are. So I have friends who work in the uh, market for cruise ships. And there was a point where you were expected to do a kid show in the afternoon and then you were expected to do a dirty adult show at night on the ship. Mm-hmm. And they, they would get complaints if the show wasn't dirty enough. Mm. And doing those things are two different skill sets for being a comedian. Usually somebody who works blue really works blue and they, they don't have the ability to shift over to do corporate events, for example. And somebody who does corporate events has developed themselves so that they have the ability to work clean and it's a little bit difficult to shift the other way. So you had to have a specialized set of skills in order to do that. You don't want to accidentally do your blue show for, for the kids in the morning, right? Right. And that changed depending on what ship you were on and, and what the, what year it was. The libraries will do a deal where they have a different theme for each thing. Now you can go in and just do a regular show. That's usually what I do. I don't do very much to do something towards whatever the theme is, but I have other friends who write new material based on what the theme is for each year that the library is up and open. All right. We're going to switch gears again. We're going to do fact or something John just made up. Sound like fun? Sure. Is it fact? <laughs> Or is it something John just made up? Ah. All right, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to say a headline. You're going to tell me whether it's true or not. And if it is true, tell me a little more about it. All right, sounds good. Here we go. First headline. Eric danced lead roles in ballet productions of Coppelia and the Nutcracker. That is true. Oh, (laughs) tell me about that. (laughs) <laughs> I have a degree in dance. Oh, do you? Yeah. And speaking of marketing, I read up on what it took to work and it, 75% of all work was in musical theater. So I took acting, singing, and dance. And I had some, some natural ability in acting and singing and I moved a lot, but I had a, some hard times remembering what steps were in dance. So mm-hmm. I really focused on that because those were, those were the three things that you needed to be successful took a lot of classes and then ended up that I had so many credits in that, that that's what I graduated in. Oh. It just made sense to go for it. So I choreographed a ballet. I was part of a, a regional ballet company called Garden City Ballet in Missoula. What did you do in the Nutcracker? I was a uh, mouse king, Russian and Arabian. And me and my buddy, Bob, Bob was playing the, the soldier dude. <laughs> so when we got to the fight, we both had experience in stage combat. So we did a real stage combat fight. We oh. had tokens and we did a whole big thing. It was almost like professional wrestling. There were flips. There was actual like sword play. Usually the nutcracker sword fight is a little kind of tippy, 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 tippy. Yeah. Oh, you stabbed me. I'm acting like I've been stabbed and I fall over and it's done for comedy. But we were doing it as like what you'd see in a martial arts movie. It was a lot of fun. So that was, in my mind at least, in my memory, it lasts as one of the most dramatic uh, Mouse King battles. 
that I, I have to tell this story because I also did the Nutcracker as Drosselmeyer. One year I was hosting a talent show. I think it was, it was the San Pedro talent show for people in San Pedro. I don't know what, whatever it was. The owner of the San Pedro city ballet comes to me and says, Oh, I understand that you're an actor. And I said, well, yes, I am. And she says, well, would you be, are you a, a, a dancer? And I said, no. And by the way, I am not a dancer. I'm not a dancer. I'm not a singer, uh -huh. actor, a magician. That's good. So she says to me, well, we're doing the Nutcracker in a few months and want to know if you want to do uh, one of the leads of Drosselmeyer. And I said, oh, yeah, sure. I can do that. Of course I can. <laughs> So I jumped in, I got back then, I got a couple of videotapes and, and watched them all and, and tried to figure it all out. And, and sure enough, for about 10 years, I ended up doing Drosselmeyer in the Nutcracker for the San Pedro City Ballet. Sweet. Next one. Eric caught on fire during a show. True. True. Yeah, that was uh, early on. That was actually in college. Um, I was doing circus night at the carousel lounge and I was eating fire and blowing fire and had some of the fluid I was using got on my neck. And when I went around to eat fire, it caught on fire. So I swatted it out, moved to the other side of my neck, swatted it out. So I ended up going, I finished this set. I did 45 more minutes of doing fire eating and blowing. And the people thought that it was an effect that somehow I'd, you know, made that happen to where it looked like I was on fire, but I was actually on fire. And then <laughs> I went to the ER and, uh, they scrubbed the grease paint out cause I was wearing like a grease paint character face thing. I walked around with this bandage around my neck because I had first and second degree burns down the outside of my neck. Oh. And, and people said, what happened, Eric? I said, oh, I fell off my six-foot unicycle. I broke my neck. Ugh. No, just kidding. I just <laughs> got on fire. <laughs> yeah, just kidding. <laughs> I just got on fire. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> all right, next one. Eric once passed out during a state fair from heat exhaustion. That is false. It is false. I am high. I am super, super hydrated. I drink uh, between each set that I do because it's very physical. I drink a Gatorade and like three bottles of water. So I'm super hydrated and I sweat a lot when I'm walking around. And I also notice you have an umbrella attached to your outfit. Yeah. For the one man band, I, it keeps me out of direct sunlight. And when I go out without it, if it's a lot of direct sunlight, especially if it's like 105 degrees as it is sometimes, it just, it saves me because I, I can go out and sing a full set. I don't dry up into a husk when I'm out there very quickly if I've got the umbrella up there. All right, last one. Eric drank two shots of tequila and juggled a frozen walleye while on a six-foot unicycle. Sounds made up, but it's true. <laughs> what is a walleye? <laughs> a walleye is a type of fish. So we're in Alexandria, Minnesota doing this thing, and it's a kind of a wild club. We were the only car parked there right truck is pulled up it's got our stuff everybody else rode their snow machines to get there the bar is very full people have been ice fishing and so there was a frozen walleye outside the bar so while i was on the six foot unicycle they handed me up a beer cup which had about two things of of tequila in it uh -huh. shots of tequila and they said drink it this is while i'm on the unicycle wanting to be the hero and being a little bit younger and stupider than I am now. Then I, I slammed the shot and then they brought up this frozen walleye. So I juggled it with two clubs <laughs> while on the, on the six foot unicycle. That was back Ooh. or something John just made up. Ah. Didn't you have, I was reading somewhere that you had a song on Dr. Demento. I had two songs actually that he's played. He played the wolf song and uh, Tease a Tiger was the name of the other one. Okay. Well, I grew up listening to Dr. Demento. For anybody who doesn't know who Dr. Demento is, he had a radio show that had all sorts of clever songs. So when I first heard Dr. Demento, it was a moment where I went, I found my people. <laughs> <laughs> People understand me. So, because I was a kid who would, you know, if you were on the bus or whatever, and, and I would have my Walkman with me, I'd say, hey, wait, you got to listen to this. And I put on their earphones and say, this is Sid Vicious singing my way. You know, <laughs> you know, 
So <laughs> the whole social media thing is just like that. It's just you find something, you go, hey, you got to listen to this. Watch this. This is ridiculous. But the Dr. Demento, yeah, there's different times in my life where I found my tribe. Mad Magazine was one where I was going, oh, I love this. This is the way I think. Oh, yeah. And that was what the Fair family was like, too. It's like, well, I do all these weird things. And yeah, I'm the, I'm the weird kid over here. And then you go to a convention and you realize, oh, wait a minute. Not only am I uh, a weird kid, but everybody else here is a weird kid too. They all do different things. And it's a chance to, you, you get together and you go, well, all of us have the same experience of being on the road all the time and yeah. away from your family and what that's like. And we all have the same experience of trying to come up with original material, stuff that people have never seen before. And that ends up being like a club that you get together with other people and you just bounce ideas off each other. We have a group that meets here in Seattle. Uh, it's me. Uh, Bill Robeson, Louis Fox, Matt Baker, Steve Hamilton, assorted other people, and we'll just get together and run ideas. And that ends up being like a family where you are just generating ideas and motivating each other to go and make new things. That's a, a really great thing to have is this this family that you're you're in with that uh, you speak the same language. Yeah, it, it is great. I, I, I think you and I are cut from the same cloth because I grew up with, with Dr. Mento, uh, Mad Magazine, and I also belong in Southern California, belong to uh, a Cadabra group, Cadabra. I thought you said Cadabra group. I was going, that's weird, John. Don't talk about that. <laughs> <A> Cadabra group. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we get together and dissect people. Just a little <laughs> dissection here. So often, like if somebody asks me what I do, like we're at a, a school function when my kids are growing up and it was, somebody said, what do you do for a living? It's like, oh, I just want to avoid this question yeah. because either they're going to assume that I do something that's, well, that's nice that you do your little sketches. That's, that's very nice. Do you still do those now? You still do your little sketches? And, uh, or the other reaction is going to be, okay, now I have to explain the entire industry to them so that they understand that I actually make a good living doing what I do and I actually charge real money for it yeah the question is do you really make a living doing that yeah you know you get a parents because your parents rightfully so have the fear that you are not going to be able to feed yourself right <laughs> so yeah. when i was juggling in the backyard it was always uh, when you're going to take a real class when you're going to get a real job it wasn't until you have some measure of success before your family finally goes oh i see you you actually are i don't know how long this is going to last you can even have close friends who go, well, how long are you planning on doing this? When are you going to finally settle down? Even today, I have, yeah. I have people who, who still think that way. It's different. I mean, we're, we're just in a different industry. Even if it's one of the larger industries in the world, you know, entertainment industry is a monster. It's one of the main exports for the United States of America. And people still don't think of it as an industry. They think of it as being something that you do as a hobby. And what do people do when they're done with their work? They come home and they get entertained. Yes, they yeah. spend a good portion of their day in listening to the people who do what I do. I still run into people that I haven't seen in 20 years, and they're saying, oh, do you still do that magic thing? I'm like, yes, I still do that magic thing. Yes, I do. <laughs> that is still what I do. do your little sketches, John. Your little skits there. <laughs> what I always tell them, I, I, say, I say, you know all those crazy things I did in high school? Now I get paid lots of money for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have some advice for the beginner? Advice for the getter. So you got to have something to do. So you just figure out whatever that is, right? I, I don't care what it is. Find an original way to do it. Find a way to package whatever that original way you're doing things is. So you do the time, write the original material, find out what your point of view is. Then you have to package that for sale. That's a step that a lot of people who are beginners don't get. You'll have a lot of practice room musicians. You have to say, uh, this is a package of what I offer. This is how much time you get with this package. This is the type of thing that you get with this package. You have, and then you turn around and you sell that in the market. So they need to understand that it's a business. It's not something you're doing for a hobby and you're not quite sure what you get paid. You need to do a little research, find out what similar acts are getting paid, and then market yourself accordingly. Mm. And don't market yourself low. Market yourself for what your act is worth. So if it's comparable to somebody else's, then you can do that. In this business, you can charge whatever you want. If you decided you wanted to do $10,000 a show and the market was willing to bear that, you can do that. Some of the, the other guys, you know, for uh, I think it's Bill Engvall, last I heard was making 100000 a show. Oh, man. So it just depends on the act and whatever the market will bear. And that's it. That's for a beginner. Yeah. How about the working pro? Working pro, be original. Hmm. That's, this is the thing that, I, that I'm going to harp on over and over and over again. Even if you're a working pro, don't steal material from other sources. Write your own stuff. I know a lot of people who just don't think they can do it, 
who are quite successful at what they do, but they haven't taken the time to go, no, I need to bump this up a notch and be original with it. I need to find a way to, to write my own jokes, not the jokes that are in there. Or uh, write my own jokes versus taking an existing joke, changing the name, yeah. and saying that it's my joke. No, it's not. You just, you just switched out what, uh, you know, you can take a drunk joke that was a Foster Brooks joke and put in Ted Kennedy or put in somebody else who has an alcohol problem and say that it's a new joke, but it's, it's not. You need to write some original material from your point of view as your character, mm. you on stage. What separates you from the other people that are in your field? Yeah. Um, I heard an interview a while back from somebody who was the light bulb magician. Marvin Roy. Yeah. Okay. So he had somebody come up and say, well, what's your secret? And he says, well, look around this floor. There's all these other people who are just magicians, but I'm the only one that's a light bulb magician. Ah, um, that was on my podcast. That was on your podcast. Okay. That's where I got it from then. Yeah. Steve Trash talking to Marvin Roy. There you have it. Steve yep. Trash. I mean, you, you don't even need to know what he does <laughs> with the name like Steve Trash. Then you go, okay, well, that's something I can identify with and people are going to book him. Just the name itself, that's something that's marketable. So for a working professional, you have to have a point of view and a character that's you. So that you're not the same magician. Oh, all, all magicians are the same. Right. So you've got to find a way to make it yours, make it original so that, um, so that you're not just another person who has a stock act. How about a recommended book or two or three or four or five or nine? Well, <laughs> got four. The Bible, first of all. Um, <laughs> that's, I hear it's very popular. Uh, it is very popular. I would recommend that one for sure. As far as other books, there are three that I will recommend to you. One is a little bit off the beaten track as far as that. Uh, Jordan Peterson's book, 12 Rules for Life, is very good, very motivational. Mm -hmm. the, the Artist Way by Julia Cameron, I would recommend that very much. Yep, I've read it. It's great. You have to do it as a workbook. You can't just read it, so yep. you've got to do some work on it. That is a, a book that tries to tell you how to unlock your creative potential without putting up a bunch of roadblocks for yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's, that's a high recommend for me as far as somebody who wants to be more original, but doesn't know how to start, get the book, go through it, work through your problems that way. And the other one would be Judy Carter's comedy Bible, because mm -hmm. it very much talks about the ability of someone to write from a point of view, write original material, find out what it is that makes your act tick. So that's, those are the three books I would recommend besides the Bible. Thanks, Eric, for doing my show. It was great. It was fun. I bet you. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. Uh, where can they get a hold of you? Uh, ComedyRocket.com is my website, so you can see all kinds of stuff. It is poorly designed and sprawling, sort of like my career. <laughs> <laughs> and they can find me on, on Facebook and YouTube and all that. Um, but if you go through my website, it has links to all of the different places where you can find me. So ComedyRocket.com. And where can they listen to your podcast? You can find the Tailgate Entertainer podcast on all the places where you get podcasts, and it's a, about the fair industry, so it's all the characters and people that are in the fair industry. Mm -hmm. So just look up on whatever your podcast thing is for Tailgate Entertainer. And I should say what the name came from. Uh, Alan Bruce, who started the podcast, when we're at a fair, will have a, a thing on his tailgate of his truck where we just, all the artists get together and we all cook food and talk and everything, and that's where the name came from. So that's okay. If that makes it any easier to remember, Tailgate Entertainer. Perfect. And thanks to all my variety artists. If you found this podcast valuable, tell a friend to listen. Say, hey, listen to this podcast. That's how we can spread the word. You can reach me from my Facebook page. Just shoot me out a message. And while you're there, join my Facebook group at The Variety Artist, where you can ask me to ask questions of our guests and join in with the Free For All Fridays and Marketing Mondays. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist, but your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist, but until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.